So uh, this is the physical situation that I want you to think about. I think it's a, a quite common situation, um, or I'll make it uh, similar to a quite common situation. Let me uh, have you imagine. Uh, I'm just going to change the green because it's the same as the other colors. Uh, that's also the same as the other colors. All right. <laughs> so you have some rectangular thing, and uh, the program sets some default parameters that's reasonable. Um, so I just leave that be. And um, we can apply a, a fixed amount of force by attaching a thruster at um, any of these uh, locations on the body. So if I have this thruster at the very bottom, then uh, I hope uh, what I'm describing now is something that makes intuitive sense that um, if I, as I apply this force, uh, let me start running the simulation. As I apply this force, um, when I'm pushing at the bottom, it, uh, becomes more likely than not that you know it'll start sliding before it uh, tips over. Now, if I attach this thruster at the top, then I hope you have this intuition from your everyday experience that as I apply greater and greater amount of force, it becomes more likely for it to tip over than to. Uh, than to slide. So with those situations in mind, in this uh, uh, particular case, it's uh, relatively easy to connect to the idea of lever arm that we introduce as we talk about forces and torque. So as we were introducing torque, if you think back, um, we introduced the torque this way. Uh, as uh, something that causes rotation that depends on two of the uh, parameters. And uh, as we'll make this a little bit more precise in a bit, uh, for now, I'll just say it's uh, force times distance. It's not quite right, but close enough. And, um, and in the example that you just saw, you can see that being illustrated. You can intuitively think of distance that matters as the distance from the ground. Um, so when I was pushing it near the bottom, then, then the torque given the same amount of force was less. So it didn't quite tend to rotate as much. And um, the thing that, uh, gave gave up earlier was the friction with the floor so it started slide and when i apply the force at the top then the distance was greater so um the, so so that for a given amount of force torque was greater so before this started sliding it tipped over now as we make this torque more precise what you will see is that um so this kind of description, it, it's great for physics 10 description. And uh, it's good for starting to build up your intuition. And as you start to deal with the more complicated pictures, eventually we have to deal with the more complicated scenarios. For example, the complicated scenario of possibly this thing. Um, how do I rotate it? So this force, not applying the way, the normal way it's applied, but maybe being applied at some weird angle like this. Then in this example, for one, if you see this force being applied, you will see that um, doesn't quite rotate as well anymore. In fact, oh, okay, so it does slide. All right, <laughs> so, so it does that. So somehow, Okay, it's not just the force and the distance that matters, the angle matters too. So more comprehensive and fuller introduction to a uh, fuller description of torque is this that you see in lecture. Torque is a vector quantity. And the way we define this vector is using cross product over in lecture. It'll be R uh, representing displacement or displacement. I'll 
diagram that here, um, cross product with the F. So on this figure here, I can note R as this. So this, so I'm going to use, so whenever you deal with the rotation, you need a kind of center of rotation. So I'm going to pick this as center of rotation without much justification or whatever. This is the place where I'm applying the force. So this displacement vector is my R. So torque vector is given by R cross, uh, uh, so the force vector would be something like this, R cross F. And you do the cross product of these two vectors, you get the torque vector. And I, we're going to do deal more with that um, next week. <laughs> no, sorry, not next week. Um, we're going to deal more with that uh, in chapter 11 <laughs> content as we deal with the angular momentum. Um, for now, let me focus on the not quite the directional aspect of it, but the magnitude of this quantity. So when we are dealing with the magnitude of torque, we can represent this a little bit more simply. We don't have to do the whole right hand roll. There's a lecture on that. <laughs> That's a separate thing. So when you're just dealing with the magnitude of torque, we can express it this way. Magnitude of torque is the, the displacement or the distance, uh, magnitude of displacement times the force, magnitude of the force, times this is the directional quantity, sine theta. And here, the angle theta is defined this way. So it's the angle between these two vectors. So I have to imagine extending this r. So this would be the angle theta here. So, um, and I, I guess in terms of just the working out the math, uh, you know, that's actually enough. Because you can see that if I rotate this uh, thruster, changing my angle. So um, if I rotate this thruster this way, so when I apply the force at a different angle, then my force vector goes this way. Um, so the angle is this angle here. And uh, so let me just uh, um, appeal to this so that uh, uh, with the sine of theta, whether you use the actual angle or if you use the, I think this is called a supplement or is it a complement? 180 degree minus the angle. Whether you use this angle, the sine of theta will be the same. Um, so, so, you know, but in this orientation, this angle is smaller. So with this smaller angle, you can, if you somehow had all the numbers, then you can work out the numbers and say, oh, yeah, my torque will be smaller because my sine theta will give me a smaller value. So you have that. Now we have two other ways of representing, expressing this uh, exact same mathematical relationship. I want to just uh, write out those two relationships and um, how that corresponds to different ways you can break down um, the how these vectors uh, how these vectors relate to each other so um, one way I can write this is um, so it, it goes down to the matter of how which how I associate this sine theta I can choose to associate this sine theta with the force if I did that um, I it would be r times uh, what we call perpendicular component of the force. So r times uh, f perpendicular, where f perpendicular would be the magnitude of force times the sine theta. Um, so here in this uh, uh, picture here, I went back to my original picture. If I have force this way, uh, what we would be saying is, okay, so if this is the theta or the effective theta anyway, um, instead of being able to use this entire magnitude of force, I would be saying, okay, I need to only take the component of the force that's uh, perpendicular to the uh, displacement vector. So we would be using this perpendicular component of force. So the, the portion of the force that's actually generating the torque would be this. This component of force is generating 
pork and this portion that's a parallel to the displacement will be wasted or it, we won't be producing any torque so that there's a, that way of um that way of grouping together the terms you see in the uh, pork magnitude formula another way to group it would be well it would be the other way <laughs> so instead of say instead of looking at uh, r times the perpendicular component of the force you could be looking at magnitude of the force times the perpendicular component of the displacement vector and so this r perpendicular would be equal to r sine theta and uh, mathematically i guess it's a uh, um you know, all this is just a different ways of <laughs> multiplying 1, 2, and 3. <laughs> Whether you multiply 2 and 3 first or 1 and 3 first doesn't really change anything. And in this picture, um, just the following the same math, you can see that um, you take, uh, what do I use? Uh, you take, it's okay, so instead of using this entire, um, entire displacement, you um, you just take the component of displacement that's perpendicular to the force. This is perpendicular, and this should be our R perpendicular. And it's this that I wanted to talk about. This R perpendicular, it has its own name. We call this a lever R. And it has its own name because it's quite useful in uh, many different situations where you have to figure out the torque and um, and do the calculation. It's uh, often conceptually useful to locate this uh, lever arm because this uh, lever arm is the portion of the displacement that actually contributes to generating torque in this uh, sense of distance. So back where we are talking about torque is force times distance, the kind of distance that matters is the lever arm. And um, and you know, I guess uh, it's easy enough to go through the geometry and locate this perpendicular component of the R vector and where it has the other component, the parallel component as well. Uh, so, you know, all of that you can do fine, no problem. <laughs> but I want you to show um, the procedure technique for locating this lever arm without necessarily going through all this uh, full vector description, vector notation. Because uh, really what the lever arm is meant to be is a kind of a shortcut. And um, if uh, in order to use the shortcut, you have to go through the full tra full vector treatment, then shortcut isn't much of, much of a shortcut. So, so I want you to... Sh um, I will need to show how visually you can locate the lever arm. And let me start out with this setup, and I will um, I will try a few different arrangements where the angle has changed a little bit, and um, show how how uh, you locate the lever. So in this picture, uh, so let me describe the procedure and um, and illustrate that here first. So. Um, when you are using this version of the expression to calculate or estimate your torque, you start out with uh, two given things. You should be given the force, the full vector quantity, as in the magnitude and direction. Um, although for this procedure, you only want the direction. Direction is what, two, what matters, one. Two, uh, you need your center of rotation. Uh, depending on the situation, there might be some obvious center of rotation that's either given or you can pick, or you might have to give some thought to uh, what the valid center of rotation is. Um, what I usually like to choose is, well, imagine that this whole thing will actually rotate. Uh, around what point do you think it's likely to rotate? This point seemed likely to me, so I picked that. Um, although I think for, yeah, so I can imagine someone picking this point. Uh, it's one of those things where you, you want to be reasonable. So, so that's the second thing. You need the force, magnitude, and direction, and the center of rotation. So once you have that, then this is the procedure that I go through to identify my lever arm. The first thing you do that uh, maybe you don't quite see the need here. Uh, let me redraw my force so that it's maybe a little bit easier to see. 
I drew my force nice and big, which is nice. But maybe the force that's given in your diagram or whatever is super small. It's just drawn small. <laughs> um, then uh, first you need to do this. You need to identify and draw your line of action. Or it's the line that you get when you extend your force, which is a vector arrow, finally length of the array, uh, <laughs> which sorry, I'm mixing up terms here. Um, you just extend that into a line, a geometric line. So in geometry, the geometric line, it doesn't actually stop at some point. It's uh, uh, something that comes in from infinity and goes out to infinity. So this would be your line of action or line of force or line of whatever. It's the thing that um, tells you um, where your force is in some sense in two dimensional plane. So once you have that, line of action, then you drop a perpendicular line from your center of rotation to your line of action. So when you do that, so you will get a segment from your center of rotation to the line of action drawn in such a way that it's perpendicular. Then this segment here, that is your lever arm. So in this example, you see that the segment I'm drawing is exactly the same as the perpendicular component of the displacement vector that I've drawn before. Um, but you know, to locate this lever arm, I didn't have to. I didn't even have to draw the actual r vector. So again, this is a, a shortcut. So the idea is to avoid having to do the, give this a full treatment. So this is one example. Let me give you a few more examples with a few different orientations. Um, let me see. Uh, let's say the, um, let's say this force uh, is act acting as um, angle that's, uh, um, yeah, that, that's pointing this way instead of the way it was pointing before. Let me uh, redraw my force so that I have uh, where, where am I? Uh, so that I have a, a force drawn in the correct direction and we'll go through this procedure again to locate the lever arm. So, yeah. so this is going to be my force and uh, I'm going to keep using the same center of rotation. So in this picture, to locate the lever arm, I would have to take the force. Extend it into a line. That's my line of action. And then, um, and then drop down a perpendicular line from the, um, from the center of rotation to this uh, line of action. So when I do that, that's my perpendicular segment. So you can see just how tiny this lever arm is. And that should go some way towards explaining why this thing never rotated. Um, so, as I, uh, so as I increase the amount of force, uh, wait, I need a simulation to run. As I increase the amount of force, it never rotates. And it never rotates because, well, the lever arm is so tiny. And there are actually other issues as well. The lever arm is going in the opposite direction from. Uh, so you can kind of see it here with this line of action. You can see with this lever arm, if force is pushing that way, then that looks like a counterclockwise thing. But this thing uh, is only set up to go clockwise. So, um, so yeah, even if. Uh, so let me just to make the material property so that the friction coefficient is super large. Even if this were never sliding, it'll still never rotate clockwise. Oh, wait, maybe the <laughs> force is large enough. I don't know. Uh, all right, all right. Let me just go back here. Uh, wait, I need to run this thing. All right. Uh, oh, wait, I think it's back. All right. Uh, let me stop fooling with it. Um, so that's one more setting. Uh, let me just uh, do a couple more. Um, or three more. So if I have, um, so I'll do one more that won't actually give you a rotation. 
and um, one more that will give you rotation and one last one that uh, I think uh, I don't know it could give me some trouble so I'm gonna just rotate this so that it uh, points straight down and see what kind of lever arm I get with that so we let me redraw the force so this is the force I'm given and with the uh, the steps to and given the force and the center of rotation the steps for locating the lever arm is it's a two-step process one you locate your line of action that's the the line that uh, at the same location as your force but it extends like a line does infinitely in either direction and once you have that, then the, your lever arm is the perpendicular distance between your center of rotation to that line of action. So this perpendicular distance, it looks perpendicular. This is your lever arm. Now, if you are simply saying, oh, so torque is a force times lever arm. This lever arm seems pretty substantial. So torque is pretty large. Um, if you're talking about the torque due to this force alone, then yeah, the, it, but watch that this is giving you counterclockwise torque, not a clockwise torque. And as this thing tries to rotate counterclockwise, there will be a lot of um, other things happening that doesn't allow it to rotate counterclockwise. Um, we'll deal with more with that uh, actually next week as we do static equilibrium. But for now, for the purpose of this demonstration, I think it's enough to show that um, this thing now won't rotate as I increase the force, as long as I do it slowly and gently. Yeah, I don't know, at some point the, the simulation just bugs out. Um, let me, yeah, so back to five meters. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, up until it's at the maximum force where it just uh, glitches out the simulation, it doesn't rotate. Because there are other things happening as I increase the thruster force, uh, but but in this setup, that's uh, how you locate the lever arm. Um, okay, let me do the next example where we'll finally actually get rotation, and we'll we should be able to compare that with the first uh, our first initial setup and see on evidence that um, the amount of torque produced at that different angle is really different. So let me just. Uh, Rotate this to, a, a, I'm gonna stop the simulation to something like a here, 30 degree down. Yeah, that seems reasonable. So, um, yeah, and, and I think this will be more interesting than other pictures we are drawing. So that's our force. And we still have our center of rotation that I think is still reasonable center of rotation. And uh, again, the lever arm is the perpendicular distance. And in order to visually locate that perpendicular distance, you do, uh, in most case, in many cases, you do need a force extended into this uh, line of action. And it really has to do with, um, you don't know where that perpendicular segment will drop down to. Uh, somehow, if your force was drawn with a long enough arrow for that to happen easily, then sure, you maybe you don't need to extend it out. But in the cases where it's quite far away, that point of contact is quite far away, you do need to extend it out. So um, I'm looking at this uh, point here, center of rotation, looking at this line, and I need to draw something perpendicular down to that line. Yeah, this is going to be it. So this looks roughly perpendicular. And this is my lever arm. And you see how this distance is here. Uh, it's shorter than it would be if this was angled slightly up. And uh, we can do a bit of an experiment to see how much force we'll need to tip this over. And let's compare that to when this was just a horizontal force. So, so yeah, that's my lever arm. And let me just bring up this uh, menu. Let's uh, start the simulation and just slowly increase the thruster force until it starts to tip. Okay, about 15 newtons. That's the force I needed to tip it. Um, and let's just finish this experiment by 
making this horizontal and just try it again. Yeah, 30 newtons. Here I needed a way less force to cause it to tip over. And, and that's a, it's showing that uh, even though the force is acting at the exact same location, when it's uh, acting at a different uh, direction, different angle, then that does change the lever arm, the distance that matters for calculating the torque. Um, okay, so I had a, one more example in mind, which was, I um, don't know how much of a trouble this would cause me. Um, so, well, uh, what I want you to do, so, so far I've been angling this down. Let me angle it up uh, and uh, see just uh, what I get with that. The reason I think it might give me trouble is I think uh, the way this is oriented, um, the, it might cause the block to fly off before it rotates. We'll, we'll see what happens. I don't know. I haven't tried it before the sessions. But uh, the, here the point of this is to illustrate how to locate the lever arm. So I, I think I can do that without... Uh, so this is the force. And the procedure for locating lever arm is still the same procedure. It hasn't changed. Um, you extend this force into a line of action so that, so that wherever the perpendicular segment happens to touch down on, you have some way to make it touch down. Um, so here, looking at this point and the line, the perpendicular segment is going to look something like this. So this is my lever arm. So that looks, um, that's longer than what I had before, but not quite the same as when the force was perpendicular. I mean, force was horizontal. So uh, let's give it a try. I'm going to uh, run the simulation and slow, slowly increase the force and let's see where it starts to tip over. Yeah, it's pretty close to the uh, the horizontal one, 30 newton. Um, I mean, it, it's possible if... I mean, it's pretty close, so it's probably pretty close. Um, or, so, okay, let me do this. I'm going to just uh, make the lever arm smaller by going to this angle. I think you can um, imagine doing it and then seeing that lever arm is smaller. And uh, let's see what will happen now. Okay, didn't tip yet. Okay, needed a little more force. Anyways, um, so that's what I wanted to demonstrate uh, how to locate the lever arm in a given setup. And again, this is a shortcut method. Um, you can always uh, use the full apparatus of the a vector um, analysis and work with the torque being displacement vector plus product with the force. This is correct, it'll always work. And the, the point of introducing and teaching shortcut methods uh, is that there are a set of questions where this uh, full approach is kind of overkill. Um, you are only dealing with the uh, uh, interactions in a plane and so the torque will be perpendicular to that plane always and um, you just need to calculate some simpler quantities so you can work with the basically torque being RF sine theta and um, and the, the identification of lever arm would be even um, even simpler shortcut, even uh, the next level shortcut. Because when you are using this, you do have to kind of work to find out what's a theta. But um, using the lever arm, depending on what information is given, what you know, sometimes you don't even have to find the theta. If somehow there's enough information in the question to just figure out what this perpendicular distance to the line of action is, then you don't actually need the theta because lever arm is enough.